um, and form more massive objects like brown dwarfs. And maybe some planets also form this way. So this could be an interesting sort of middle ground between the two, um, the two mechanisms. Um, yes, and so there are some simulations that support a rough range for gravitational fragmentation that the minimum mass for fragmentation would be anywhere between one to five Jupiter masses. Uh, from observations, we have seen objects that have likely four Jupiter masses. Um, there is this example that I'm talking about 20, uh, 11, 19 is a binary system of brown dwarfs. We know that they're about four Jupiter masses because they're part of a moving group. Otherwise we wouldn't really, we need a lot of follow-up to figure out. Ages are really hard <laughs> to figure out for brown dwarfs. Um, so we think they're four Jupiter masses. Um, and in general, and there's a study also by Schlaufmann 2018, who, where they talk about um, the likelihood that there are, that we find more massive objects around more uh, metal rich, sorry, around more, less massive objects around like more metal rich uh, stars. And, um, but they, they set a limit around four to 10 Jupiter masses, sort of implying that below um, this four to 10 Jupiter mass limit, we're definitely using core accretion to form planets. Above um, that limit, we're likely using this fragmentation or gravitational fragmentation. So we essentially don't know at this point how brown dwarfs and giant planets form. We're not entirely sure of what, what are the mechanisms that lead to these planets. But the different formation mechanisms do leave uh, hints on the present day systems. One of, one of them is, for example, the metallicity. So in principle, if we have an, a system that is forming like a binary system where both star and uh, low mass companion are formed almost simultaneously from the same molecular cloud, we expect that both of them would have the same composition. Whereas if we're forming an object in a disk after volatiles have evaporated, then we expect the metal content of the companion to be slightly higher than that of the primary. And there's some work being done um, on this and trying to understand uh, compositional differences. We're not there yet, but I think that's the future. And when it comes to brown dwarfs again, it's very hard to identify, to, um, to calculate their metallicities because I'll show you some atmospheres and they're full of molecular bands. <laughs> so it's very hard to identify, um, you know, what, what the composition of these objects are. But, um, but we're starting to work on retrievals of atmospheres in, for brown dwarfs. And that, I think that's the way of the future to try to understand the differences between the two, um, between companions and primaries. Uh, and overall, the other, um, but I think the important, the idea with this is that we can talk about um, trying to understand the formation of brown dwarfs and giant planets as in the context of binary formation as well, because then we have a good sample because all planets, as far as we know, we're gonna find, find them around stars. So then if we're finding an analog system is some kind of brown dwarf around a star as well, um, or a brown dwarf, but essentially, I think this way we can compare sort of apples to apples. Um, and we'll see that there are, uh, composition is one of the hints of um, one of the relics of how, how these objects formed. But another one that's really important is gonna be um, the system architectures. And so with this, by studying populations and estimating their multiplicities, um, I think that we can get to this point where we can assess formation. So there are some predictions on brown dwarf formation and how we can connect this to um, on some predictions on the multiplicity that's um, as a result of a given mechanism. Uh, so by ejecting pre-stellar cores where uh, a brown dwarf is just a result of a, of a star that did not have enough mass to become a star, um, it's about 8%. From this fragmentation simulations, it should be about 16% of the time that we make a brown dwarf mass object. Um, from core fragmentation, it's unclear. And photo evaporation of pre-stellar cores, while important as a 
mechanism, it might not be the prevalent one. This is when we have a, um, a very, very bright star, massive star, pushing stellar winds so that a nearby companion protostar forming just doesn't have enough mass in order to become a star, so it becomes a brown dwarf. Um, and so it does seem like simulations and observations agree at first glance. This is a plot from Bay 2012, uh, that uh, ejection of crystallic cores paper. And what they did was they compared the simulations, they compared their simulation results, which are in blue, to, um, to measurements from the literature, which are in black. And that dashed line shows the rough 8% solar mass difference between what a star is to the right and what a brown dwarf is to the left. Um, and we see that there is a trend of multiplicity that is correlated with a higher primary mass. Higher primary mass usually means that system that uh, objects are found in systems more often. But in reality, uh, observations are much more complicated. And there seems to be a spread between, um, there seems to be a spread, especially at the lower masses. Maybe that's my own bias because I absolutely know those objects more and this is why I found many more uh, binary fractions in the literature for those. But um, there's definitely a, a, a bias here. What's not being told in this plot is, are we talking about the same separations? Are we talking about the same mass ratios? And what are the completeness of the surveys that came up with all of these observations? Um, so here, at this point, I want to highlight a few systems that I think are really interesting to understand this, uh, this point of, the, of how the system architectures can imply something about formation. So we have systems like this one that I mentioned earlier, 1119. In this case, we have two objects that are likely for Jupiter masses. So the mass ratio is one. The separation is very closely separated. This is not this is probably a very inoffensive binary system, very low mass binary system. Um, this is one of my favorites, 1207b. Is, uh, it was the first directly imaged planet, and I make air quotes <laughs> that will make me unpopular, but um, it is, uh, it's about a five Jupiter mass object, and it's orbiting a 33 Jupiter mass brown dwarf, quite far. And, um, but the binary system, the sorry, the mass ratio for the system is very low. Um, and again, I'm highlighting separation and mass ratio as two important factors to try to understand what was the origin of the systems. There's also Cap Andromeda, a big star, a big massive star, 2.5 solar masses, and it has a 12 Jupiter mass object. But this um, but in this case, the mass ratio is much, much lower. We're talking about 10 to the minus three. Um, HR 8799, which if it's not your favorite planetary system, then it probably should be. It's really interesting. Um, we're, now we have four very massive Jupiter-like planets at different separations. Um, and, the, and another kind of like puzzling system is uh, 0806, a favorite amongst brown dwarf uh, scientists. The companion is a white dwarf, letter Y. Very few of these. They're extremely faint, extremely cold, really interesting objects. Um, and it's orbiting a white dwarf. So we don't exactly know the mass of the progenitor star, but it's, it, um, there are some models that say that it's probably around two uh, solar masses. And, um, and that would put, I mean, either way, this is a very extreme mass ratio very far distance and um and this probably means that back in the day when the white dwarf was a star then the separate the mass ratio was also kind of similar to cap andromeda but again we're talking about a very widely separated object um oh and as a bonus uh <laughs> i just um we are also seeing that exoplanets in, bi in visual binaries uh are have have architectures that are sort of relics of formation. Um, so I just worked on this really interesting paper with uh, Clemence Fontenay, where we gathered pretty much all of the literature of systems that we could find from any spectral type and um, within 200 parsecs. And we found that more often, more massive companions um, are found in uh, binary 
systems that have a companion survey. Let me break this down for you. So um, what we did was to gather the literature and try to find all of the planets that were within 200 parsecs. We found something like 1200 planets um, and the primer, the host stars were anywhere between M dwarfs all the way to A stars, I believe. And, um, and then we broke the systems down by mass ratio, by companion mass and by separation. And um, this is, we didn't have a statistical, statistically significant sample, but what we wanted to do with this study was sort of to understand the trends so that then we can, you know, follow up with a more, um, with a well-designed survey for this kind of system. And what we found was, I have my little, um, <laughs> I made an, an easier legend for you on the left. Um, what we found was that in systems, sorry, very close in companions, meaning planets or brown dwarfs, to, um, to stars in binary systems, which are three colors in the bottom, uh, if we break them down by separation of the binary, um, of the stellar binary, then we find that the more, the farther away the companion, the stellar companion is, the less it affects the, um, the planetary system. And so if you see in this curves, for example, the, um, the dashed line, which is the single stars, the planets are written in single stars, um, is very similar to the blue line that are the systems, the binary systems that have a planet where the companion is very, very far away. Um, so what all of this suggests is that there is a, an influence from the star into the, to the planetary system that can prevent the occurrence rate of, um, of the companions and can prevent also, um, and can have an influence in how, um, how in the architecture of the planetary system itself. So now that we're familiar with uh, separations and mass ratios, um, this is a plot from Caitlin Crater's 2010 paper where they talked about this fragmentation. And here we see on the x-axis separation and on the y-axis mass ratio of a bunch of stellar and planetary systems. The planetary systems are to the lower left and the stellar systems are to the top right. And, um, and they, those uh, bright magenta objects, those are the HR8799 planets. So this is right after they were discovered. Um, that it was found that they were in a very interesting place of this plot. And, and this plot, like why does this plot really matter is because this tells us, this plot tells us um, roughly how objects were formed. Um, now in 2021, there are um, those two boxes that were sort of indicative of, oh, this 8799 planets, we don't know, they're sort of in the middle between these two populations and we don't understand, we don't have anything in these gaps. If, these, if the top box were gonna be filled later on, then, um, then maybe HR 8799 planets are an extreme of that top section. If they were, if the bottom box is filled, then maybe we're talking about an extreme of the bottom section. Um, both boxes are filled now <laughs> in this, uh, like after a few years. Um, and, but very few of these objects have masses that are, that are not model independent, that are, Yes, that are model independent because, um, so for example, on the right plot, I show these green uh, points at the top. Those are the only brown dwarfs that have dynamical masses. All of the systems have mass ratios close to one. Those are very bright to follow up. Uh, following up these systems is also, um, also takes a long time and it's a big effort. So each one of these systems is precious, but, um, but it's very hard to do. And if I include the stellar binaries as well, then I think it's much more clear to see that there are these two groups for sure, but there are a lot of objects in the center. Um, I have shaded the objects in the center with my eyes, <laughs> nothing. I'm trying to figure out if that is, that is actually a statistical value, how I'm calling it. Um, because then I think that it could 
imply that those are the intermediate, those are the objects that are formed in some intermediate way, not quite like planets, not quite like stars. And what I find really interesting is that all of these points that are in blue are imaging discoveries. So they have been, um, so if we can check whether imaging is actually sensitive throughout, then we can decide if um, we can decide if that valley is statistically significant and real, or if we need if we need to go out and do a big survey around these mass ratios and separations, because right now we don't. These are all the systems that we have. Um, so this brings back to the idea that I mentioned earlier that each detection technique for binary and planetary systems is sensitive to a range of separations and mass ratios. Mass ratios are very hard for brown dwarfs because they are, because mass ratios, um, sorry, because brown dwarfs evolve over time. And so it's hard to pin down the age, it's hard to pin down the mass, the spectral type that you see and the temperature that you assign is, um, is what is showing you today, but they actually cool over time. So then it's, it's really hard to assess um, we don't have a mass uh, luminosity relationship when it comes to brown dwarfs. It's a mass age luminosity relationship, and age is really hard to find. So, um, but here we have some opportunities. Um, here we see on the closest separations, the best uh, technique to identify systems is radial velocity. On the broader separations, imaging is for sure the best one um, and is fastest. And then there's a nice niche between the two filled by astrometric variability that's in green. Um, and we expect that Gaia will fill in for a lot of the systems on the more, on the hotter, more massive brand wars. Uh, Gaia will fall a little short when it comes to the faintest brand wars. The, I think I only, I think there's only about 10 uh, objects beyond L5 that are found in Gaia. So, um, so it really becomes challenging for the cooler objects. But it's a big, it's a big help, at least for the more massive ones. And, um, and yes, and right now I'm working on trying to map these, um, this selection functions, as I'm, as I'm talking about, so that, so we understand whether, um, how, so we can understand essentially like what are the separation and mass ratio sensitivities for each of the techniques that we use the most. But clearly we are, um, we're constrained by separation. So during my PhD, I worked on a, on a technique to identify binary systems of brown dwarfs that is independent of separation up to 5.5 arc seconds, which again, for the local volume, that uh, that I'm interested in, it's um, it covers most of the it covers most of the binary systems for um, for brown dwarfs, but it has a few caveats. So um, so we're calling them spectral binaries. The way that this works is that is when we have binary systems that are very closely separated in angular space, and um, and they have different temperatures, so they have different spectral types. So when you get one single unresolved spectrum, it looks peculiar. How peculiar? Well, it depends on the components, and uh, and assessing the peculiarities is um, is precisely what we did in order to identify and characterize the systems from the unresolved spectrum. So in this case, we have most of these systems that we have identified are field objects within 25 parsecs. Um, and because they're field, and because they're, because they're field, um, and one of them tends to be a late M early L, whereas the other one tends to be a T dwarf. T dwarfs are cold. T dwarfs are about a thousand Kelvin or colder. Um, and T dwarfs are not stars anymore, for sure. Whereas the primary here in these systems is very likely a star. So what we're probably seeing are field objects that have evolved such that the, the, um, the secondary is a brown dwarf that has cooled down to very low temperatures, but the primary is still a star, very, very low fusion star. And, um, and it has stayed at a temperature that is, um, you know, that is low but stable 
So essentially we're seeing these spectral binaries are systems that have a, a star and a brown dwarf typically field and um, but they're both right around the hydrogen burner limit. Yes, and we need to have both components fit on the slit and um, these having distinct uh, spectral types because that leads to distinct spectra, which is what we identify with this technique. Uh, and as a bonus, my student Afra is working on developing an empirical technique to identify variability on brown dwarfs based on the indices from this technique to identify spectral binaries. Um, the connecting thought here is that spectral binaries are identified as a single peculiar spectrum as a spectral blend and variability depending on the geometry of the clouds on a single brown dwarf may also show um, almost like two different atmospheres, two different atmosphere layers, but that they're cloudy and, and so, sorry, that they're Apache. And so you'll get some light from below and some light from the top. And then uh, you also get a blended light spectrum. So she's working on, on making a whole technique just to, um, just to find the variability, the variable objects, which are right now one of the most interesting avenues in order to understand planetary atmospheres as well. Um, so in order to understand what are the biases of the technique and in order to find a binary fraction that was independent of separation in the local, in the 25 parsec volume, um, I set out to do a volume limited sample because we wanted robust statistics. And, um, and so here I'm showing some, some plots that, uh, that show the entire sample. I think the important numbers are to say that there's about 400 sources that are M7 and later, M7, sorry, between M7 and L5. I'm interested in, in identifying potential primaries to these spectral binary systems that would have a T dwarf companion. So there's about 410 M7 to L5 objects. Um, we were about 70% complete in our, in our spectroscopic sample. And if I, if I count all the, um, all the binary systems within the sample published in the literature, it comes out to about 8%. Um, but again, that's not, that's not specifying the separation and the mass ratio to which I was sensitive. Uh, and we find about five objects within this whole volume that are spectral binaries. So the spectral binary fraction is pretty low. It's about 1.8%. Um, one thing to remember about spectral binaries is that the technique has two steps. The first step is to find, is to measure spectral indices. And the second step is to, um, to do binary template fitting on the, on the binary, on the blended light spectrum. And um, if I were to count the objects coming from only the indices, this, um, this fraction goes up to about 6%. Um, and I'm still trying to understand what are the differences, why, um, why some objects don't actually make it to the next stage of the, of the binary template fitting. Um, but with this sample, then what I wanted to find was not the spectral, but the observed spectral binary fraction. What I wanted to find was the true binary fraction of the population. And so for this, what I did was to simulate the population of uh, brown dwarfs of brown dwarf binaries, essentially, 100% brown dwarf binaries, and then try to understand how many brown dwarf binaries are selected by this technique, right? So I have, I have my observed sample that tells me you have observed 1.8% uh, of spectral binaries, but with the simulated population, I have 100% of binaries, and I want to see how many are spectral binaries. Um, so I, I used um, a log normal IMF and two power low IMFs and uh, four different H distributions. Those are to the right and the bottom, bottom left are two different mass ratio distributions. And on the bottom right, um, that's a secondary mass. So essentially my, my inputs were an IMF to each mass, I assigned an H and then to his each mass and age, I assigned a mass ratio that would give me a secondary mass that had the same age, I have a system. Uh, then I evolved those systems through different spec 
through different uh, evolutionary models and get temperatures for each object. And then from the temperatures, I can translate the temperature into a spectral type, which is what I finally observed. So, um, so what I did was, um, was to generate, I think it came out to 96 different populations of binary systems, of 100,000 binary systems each. And, um, and then I, I studied the different populations and try to understand what trends I see. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting, if you take a look on the, on the bottom left, is how um, there's a little age spread on the, if I were to take a, um, one of the populations and then compare, slide, like, compare the differences of the other ones, keeping one variable constant, keeping all variables constant, sorry, like only changing one variable, you get these plots. So in the bottom left, um, these are four populations where the age changes, but all the other parameters are the same. They have the same mass ratio, the uh, distribution, the same IMF and the same evolutionary model, but the population shifts according to the average age of the input age distribution. So in this case, I used uh, the red distribution is a, is a uniform distribution capped at seven giga years, assuming that the sun is in the disk of the galaxy and we're only looking at a small 25 parsec volume. So most of the stars should be around the same age. We don't have any halo stars, maybe some stragglers, but not really, we shouldn't be seeing very old stars. Um, so that was the rationale for the uniform seven. Uniform 10 is saying, all right, well, my model goes to 10 giga years, so why not? Um, the Omer distribution and the Rujapakarn distribution are a little bit different. Those are, uh, Rujapakarn actually assumes that there was a spur of star formation back at a, at a very high redshift, um, so very early in the universe. And then Omer is kind of um, a middle ground between those two, where um, we also expect a high, um, a lot of star formation in the past. So essentially the Rujapakarn and the Omer distributions are biased towards older ages, whereas the uniform distributions are biased towards younger ages. And you see that spread, especially around L0, T0 on the LT transition where, um, where we know that objects uh, evolve very quickly. And another one, interestingly, around the T to Y transition. Um, and I don't think that's actually well understood why. We see some differences also on the secondary spectral type with regards to the mass ratio distribution that was used. Uh, between the Allen 2007 and the Burgasser 2004 mass ratio distributions, they're both power loss, but the Burgasser one is steeper. So um, the Burgasser one actually, they both assume that most binary systems are equal mass for brown dwarfs, which is also what we see from very few observations. Um, and, and for this reason, there are essentially more binary systems that can cool down, um, sorry, more, there will be more binary systems that are about the same mass in the red distribution in this plot. And, uh, and that's seen as a little like a bump on the earlier um, spectral types. Um, I also calculated the selection function for the spectral binary technique and there are not really many surprises here. The technique was designed to identify systems with a late M early L primary and a theta of secondary. And that is roughly what we see with some false positives, I hope. <laughs> um, and over here, these are the, this is how those, this is how the technique maps to the physical parameters of the, uh, of the populations. So apparently we should be, um, pretty good at understanding uh, systems from any age. That's what I'm seeing on the lower left plot. And, um, and, but I do believe there's a bias there. We don't really know that many young brown dwarfs. So, um, so it's likely that we just don't have good enough templates below one gig a year. Um, but what's really nice to see is how this technique is uh, independent of separation, again, in the, definitely independent of angular separation up to, um, sorry, independent of physical separation is, and dependent of the angular separation up to about 0.5 arc seconds, which is how wide our slit is to get the data. But it also seems to have a very nice distribution of mass ratios. And around this, um, and since most 
mass, most binary systems are about equal mass, then it's very important to have complementary techniques like this one that can probe the mid mass ratio, this, the mid mass ratios of systems that are usually um, overlooked. And this is a lot of information. I'm happy to talk about any of these plots in more detail after, um, after the talk. So um, yeah, I, I could go on and on forever for these. <laughs> and um, one of the final things that I, uh, that I wanted to calculate was, well, what is the binary fraction? What is the true binary fraction of this population? And it depends, of course, on the population. Uh, that's, that's kind of the whole point. Uh, I simulated 96 populations. And for each one, there is a different true binary fraction because that is based on uh, how many that's based on a different shape of the population and how many binary, how many spectral binary systems I was able to identify in that particular distribution. Um, but we can we can see some trends for sure. So it's um, it's clear in this plot in the left plot what I'm showing are the minimum and the maximum binary fractions. What I mean with that is the minimum is the most constrained one of 1.6 uh, observed spectral binary fraction. The maximum is the one where I only take the indices in order to determine spectral binaries. And the reason why I'm using this is because on the simulation, I did not, um, I was limited by computations in order to do the spectral binary template fitting to all of the over 13 million uh, binaries that I created. So this is what we're working with. Um, but it's very clear from this, I think, is first of all um, that the uniform age distribution that goes out to seven giga years, seven or eight giga years, um, that came out to be the most likely. Um, that came out to be the most likely distribution after uh, I did a binomial uh, probabilities model selection on these, um, and also the power law mass ratio distribution from Burgasser, so a steeper one, that came out to be more often the case, uh, the top one. Um, it's the log normal IMF from Chavier was a little bit closer to the middle. Um, so there's a mix of power laws that are in the, that are sort of selected at the top that would be uh, the more likely ones, but they're all power law shaped. Um, it's likely that between M7 and L5, I am not yet sensitive to the steeper, um, the steeper fall of the IMF towards the lower masses. So there's that. So I don't think this experiment is very sensitive to power law, to um, IMF, sorry. But it is, um, I, I think the age distribution, I think that's pretty solid. Um, and from this, I was able to calculate a binary fraction of about 10 to 35%, which is not, super exciting yet. <laughs> um, but so based on the top model from this binomial um, probabilities selection, 10 to 35 is the mix of the minimum and the maximum um, binary fractions. So I think it's actually likely to be lower than that between 10 and 17 roughly, because um, in our 2014 paper, when we presented the spectral binary technique, um, we found that the, the second step of the, um, of the template fitting, the binary template fitting to the spectrum, uh, reduced the number of candidates to about half. So this is a step that we haven't taken in this, um, in this population study, which is why I think that we're probably overestimating the number of binaries currently. The lower limit, I do think that that is, that is pretty much set in stone, especially because out of the, from the five spectral binaries that I found in the 25 parts example, all of them are by now confirmed uh, spectral binaries. So there's no wiggle room there. That one is absolutely a hard limit. At least we found 10% of a binary fraction. Um, and then here to the right, I'm showing where the binary fraction fits within this other, this whole range of different uh, spectral types. Um, but yes, again, this plot, the 
hard thing to understand about this plot still is that um, all of all of these binary fractions are sensitive to different mass ratios and separations. Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done in order to uniformize how we calculate uh, multiplicity fractions and in order to, to compare like to like. Um, and so in summary, um, I think that multiplicity statistics, system architectures and compositions combined can constrain formation mechanisms of brown dwarfs and giant planets. And we've measured the true binary fraction of M7 to L5 dwarfs in a volume limited sample um, through the spectral binary technique. And we have, um, we're pretty sure that the age and mass ratio distributions for the generating, sorry, that the age and mass ratio distributions, I have a mistake there, uh, <laughs> seem to be the more, um, seem to be the strongest generating functions for this population at least the more likely. And this means that um, our population of late M early L brown dwarfs is likely bias young and, um, and that the population of binaries in there are likely mostly equal mass, more equal mass than we would think with other uh, mass ratio distributions. And in the future, what I want to do is uh, complete this 25 parsec census down to the lowest masses of white dwarfs. Um, and essentially we can, um, we can calculate the observed binary fractions combining several techniques, not just one, um, because techniques are complementary to each other. And we really need this full view of the, of the whole parameter space. Brown dwarfs are really faint. And so it's very hard to do RV, it's very hard to do astrometry on most of these systems. Um, this is why we end up using different, uh, for different observational techniques in order to identify the, um, to identify systems. And, um, and this is really where we, with brown dwarfs, we're sort of like reaching the limits of our, um, of our instrumental capabilities typically. Um, but, once we can, but if we manage to complete the census down to lowest masses, and then we can, you know, use some meta analyses to combine all of these different multiplicity fractions into one, um, then I think we can learn a lot about how brown dwarfs form altogether. Um, and then we can get compositions of the 25 parsec um, benchmark systems through retrievals that are, that we're just starting to work on with brown dwarfs in order to understand uh, whether we see a trend with the primary star, if this is really a way, uh, if we need to get to enough precision so, so that we can really say that, yes, this object formed simultaneously with the star or formed later. Um, and based on all these pieces, we can eventually build a hierarchical Bayesian model of formation where we essentially have like limited information for different, um, let's say hints that the formation mechanisms have left us. Um, so we can combine all of this on a bigger um, and bigger model that takes into account this like, you know, different pieces of information into one complete model. So with that, I'll take any questions and thanks again for your attention. Thanks, Daniela. Um, super interesting talk. I have a couple of <laughs> questions, but um, I want to let people who are on the call right now, um, please raise your hand if you have some questions before I start asking Daniela a bunch of things that popped in my head. So we'll wait, we'll wait a second um, if anybody has their hand up for anything. And of course, if you do have questions and you want to ask later, you can um, email Daniela, I can pass on her email address. Yes. All right, so I'll just go ahead first because right now nobody has their hand up. Um, okay. So you mentioned uh, kind of, and along with this future work, you mentioned uh, that the white dwarf binary detection is pretty rare and that uh, being able to kind of reconstruct the mass of the system, like kind of the um, like progenitor pre-evolution type mass is mm -hmm. also a tricky thing. Um, but I wonder, is there, so in terms of, as you start to explore this and go kind of farther down and you look at evolution for these larger stars, um, like what, is it actually feasible in order to basically say how many things have been engulfed, how many things have been stripped? Um, is that something where you can reconstruct some of these populations, do you think? 
That's really interesting. Um, quick answers, I don't know, but let me think through this. So I, I've been thinking a lot about the system, 0806. Uh, it's very interesting, again, because yes, it's a white dwarf compared to a white dwarf. Uh, I don't know enough about white dwarfs, but this is why I think that there's some uh, questions on what the progenitor mass is, right? So, um, but um, the system has a mass ratio that is, that looks like it could be a planet companion because after all it falls on that bottom um it falls on that bottom side of the of the mass ratio separation plot so um so it has a mass ratio that is more likely to be that is more typical of planetary systems um the object itself is about seven jupiter masses which is above the um the minimum mass for fragmentation whether you're looking at theory or observations, so that's safe. Um, and that so then it could be a binary system. The separation is very large, and we absolutely don't understand much about how wide systems survive and how often they survive. Um, it is typical if you have a closer in system with any dynamical uh, interactions, they would actually get closer in. So maybe this system was born already fairly far out and maybe just didn't have enough interactions in its life um, or had interactions that would like push it farther away. So, um, so I don't know, I think there's, and yes, there's the post envelope uh, evolution that we are also not even thinking too much about that could, also, that could have also pushed the object farther if it was at an intermediate distance, if it was too close, it would have probably engulfed it. Um, so I, I do think that we can, we have a bunch of pieces that we can put together in order to understand the history of this uh, system and any other that were, that would be kind of similar, but it's absolute speculation at this point. <laughs> Sounds like we need to detect more of these uh, interesting systems. Yes, I agree. Uh, which reminds me, I, I forgot to mention also that, um, I'm working with the Vacker Worlds uh, collaboration, and um, and we this is this is what we do, right? We're trying to find uh, really faint white dwarfs in in white data, and it's been amazing. Uh, the citizens are so excited and so enthusiastic, and they find really amazing objects um, that I think have been missed before. So it's been it's been really fun. So this work is being done, I guess is my point. That we are we are actively looking for very faint brown doors, and some of them companions to um, to stars and benchmark systems as well. Awesome. Um, so I'll, if I have one more question, but I'll wait for a hand because uh, I don't want to just pepper. <laughs> All right, for, for a little shy today, we can always like I said, you can always ask questions uh, later. So. Um, the spectral binary analysis, sorry, we have another. Um, so the spectral binary uh, um, kind of analysis that you're talking about, that's super interesting to me, especially when you talk about kind of these compositions as you start to look at retrievals and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have a spectral bi, do you have good enough SNR to get basically spectral binary, you know, spectra for as a function of phase? And can you extract metallicity then? for maybe the companion that can kind of give you ideas about kind of these evolution models? What do you mean it's a function of phase? So, I mean, I assume um, if you're integrating and getting the spectra, um, mm -hmm. if you, for example, have some of these smaller companions that have clouds, you know, a bunch of sedimentation, yeah. um, those will end up, I think, having pretty different spectra as a function of where in the orbit right. relative to the primary mm -hmm. thing. And that can actually be really useful to pulling out some of those metallicities. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, is that something where you then, can you connect that formation then depending on your primaries or is it all just too degenerate? Um, I think it's very degenerate, but I don't think we know enough yet. So uh, this is why uh, my, my student effort has been working on trying to modify the spectral binary technique to identify variables instead. And variability is, a, is an observation of a very complex process going on in the atmospheres, right? So all you get is a, is a wiggly light curve, but uh, in the atmosphere, you don't know if, uh, if you're looking at a banded structure like you would in Jupiter, um, or if you're looking at a, a two 
top, uh, two layers of clouds, you know, um, what we think we're seeing, in fact, I'm ready for this, uh, what we think we're seeing with, um, with the variables is, um, is probably something like this, essentially, or this. <laughs> so it could be kind of a banded structure, which would give you a flat light curve in the right inclination, you know, um, but, but we still have some form of a blended light spectrum. And the spectra that we're using all come from the Specspressin library. So it's a spectrum of like maybe, maybe 40 minutes of integration, which for a brown dwarf that rotates in roughly five hours, it's a good chunk of its, uh, of its rotation. So we're really, so our spectra is already integrated light over time. And this is, I think, where the, a lot of the degeneracy comes. So the data we have right now is probably not, not the best for this, but um, if we, um, but we could do some form of, uh, of uh, spectroscopic variability on, on any object, you know, if you like cover a whole, I don't know, say a rotation, and then you keep taking spectra every so often. Um, some studies have done this. Elena Mojavacas, who is one of our collaborators for this, uh, for this variability project, uh, she, she has done this with HST, and there are definitely like pieces of the spectrum over time, the same spectrum that seem to seem to change a lot. For example, the water band that's not accessible from the ground around 1.4. Um, and one more thing that I was thinking of is that retrievals on brown dwarfs, I think the process is different from doing retrievals on planets, of which I really don't know much about. But on brown dwarfs, we use low resolution spectra, like the spec spectra, because um, it's so computationally intensive that we cannot do higher resolution spectra. And, uh, but again, all the spectra that we have used for retrieval so far has been integrated light over 40 minutes an hour. So it could be a really interesting experiment. And I think maybe Johanna's working on that, Johanna Voss, who is in our research group. Um, and in understanding, um, yes, like if we could do retrievals at, at different points in the, in the variability cycle, I think that could be really interesting. Yeah, that's, that's uh, super interesting, obviously. And you can imagine people want to push this down to planets, but you know, yeah. Doors, that'd be a really cool thing to start to look at too. So let's see, are there any other questions? Otherwise, I'll wait a, a little bit. And otherwise, I'll just thank you again, Danielle. Thank you for giving this talk on April Fools and giving us <laughs> a not tricky, you know, yeah. presentation about cool stuff. Um, but uh, thanks again. And if you want Danielle's email, if you want to contact her about her um, EPO stuff as well, uh, feel free to message me and I can go ahead and pass that on. Thanks, Danielle. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone.